Hello, human geographers. We are back at it again this evening. Tonight, we're going to examine the origins and influences of urbanization. So let's begin by defining that word, urbanization. Urbanization is the increase in the percentage of people who live in cities, which eventually outstrips the number of people living in rural areas. It is also the process of city formation and expansion. So we begin tonight by looking at where, how, and why the first cities formed and then began to expand. A city is a nucleated settlement of people and buildings clustered together to serve as a center of politics, culture, and economics. At their core, cities are high density and high concentrations of people, especially compared with the lower density and more dispersed rural areas. So how did these first cities form? The formation of cities is known as the first urban revolution. As people transitioned from hunter-gatherers to sedentary farmers, a variety of things changed. First off, they didn't need to travel around as much and could remain in one place, especially in river valleys where the soil was fertile. This allowed them to grow food and control its supply so that they could produce a food surplus. That surplus allowed some members of the community to do things other than agriculture, like carpenters who could build permanent houses and buildings to store that food. Quickly, a social hierarchy emerged. There were leaders whose sole responsibility was maintaining order and ensuring that the settlement survived and thrived. And these early agricultural villages eventually grew until they became the first cities. So Mesopotamia, East Asia, Mesoamerica, among others, were all hurts of agriculture and urbanization. And as agricultural goods and innovations diffused from their hurts, so too did the concept of clustering in larger settlements. Cities continued to grow throughout the Greek and Roman empires in Europe, while the Aztec Empire built the largest pre-Columbian city on the site of what is now modern-day Mexico City. But it wasn't until the early 1800s that cities really expanded. During the Industrial Revolution, huge numbers of people migrated to cities as they were pulled there by economic opportunities and factories. Cities expanded rapidly in what is known as the Second Urban Revolution. And of course, we connect these concepts because the second urban revolution was happening at the same time as the second agricultural revolution, which combined with the industrial revolution to begin a demographic transition. And the expansion in economic opportunities impacted society with the emergence of a middle class between the working and wealthy classes. So once again, we emphasize this period in the late 18th and early 19th centuries was a period of profound change in human history. But other than agricultural surplus, why do cities begin where they do? Well, we have to talk about two concepts that we introduced in Unit 1 called site and situation. So let's start with site. Site refers to the unique internal physical character of a place, including its absolute location and spatial character. So when we talk about site characteristics of early cities, we're talking about the actual place or location of the settlement. What climate did these areas have? How much available water was there? Things like that. So early cities were on sites in river valleys with productive agricultural land and water that could be used to irrigate crops. But later cities were influenced by other site characteristics as well. Rivers and waterways were not only important for irrigation, but also for transportation and sanitation. London is located at a point where the Thames River narrows, while early U.S. cities like Pittsburgh 
were located near navigable waterways. While flat land was ideal for farming and building, Greek city-states emerged in mountainous areas, which were easily defensible. Other cities were built on natural harbors. New York City, Rio de Janeiro, and Sydney all have natural harbors. Other cities emerged as a result of raw materials. San Francisco emerged during the California Gold Rush, and Kimberley in South Africa has one of Africa's richest diamond mines. On the other hand, situation is the external attributes of a place relative to another place. Situation refers to the connections between a city's site and other sites. Does the city have access to trading partners or other sources of labor? Major cities like Damascus and Samarkand emerged and thrived due to their situation along the legendary Silk Road, a trading route that connected Europe and Asia. Likewise, many U.S. cities benefited from improvements in transportation and infrastructure. Chicago is a good example. Chicago grew because of its situation within the United States. The Erie Canal connected the Great Lakes via the Hudson River to the Atlantic Ocean. Combine this with the fact that Chicago was the meeting point of many railway lines from both east and west. Chicago grew significantly as a result of its situation. So beyond site and situation, what are other factors that have influenced changes in urbanization? Let's continue talking about the influence of transportation and communication improvements. Innovations such as railroads, streetcars, trolleys, light rail systems, airplanes, buses, and subways have shaped and reshaped the layout and size of cities and their surroundings over time. These improvements have made it possible for both people and activities to move farther from the city center to cheaper land on the outskirts. The earliest suburbs were called streetcar suburbs and developed along streetcar lines. The mass production of automobiles combined with the interstate highway system significantly expanded personal mobility. Improvements in communication have allowed people to remain connected despite the friction of distance, a process we've called time-space compression. The telegraph was faster than mail. The telephone was faster than the telegraph. And the internet has made it possible for people in completely different cities, even countries, to communicate and collaborate in real time. Historically, the growth of cities has predominantly been driven by rural to urban migration. But the UN estimates that natural increase of city populations has driven more recent growth, especially as we see here in Africa. So let's examine these two demographic factors that influence the growth of cities. As industrialization occurred, people moved to cities. They were pushed away from rural areas due to decline in economic opportunities and pulled to cities by the prospect of jobs and factories. In recent decades, most of the rural to urban migration has occurred in periphery and semi-periphery countries. For example, in 1980, less than 20% of China's population lived in cities. Today, that number is over 60% and is estimated to exceed 70% by 2025. And all of this occurred after the implementation of the one child policy. Again, job opportunities are the dominant pull factor. We've seen this in San Jose, the largest city in Silicon Valley, which grew from about 200,000 people in 1960 to over 3 million in 2020, driven by the pull of high paying jobs in the tech industry. Shenzhen, a port city in China, saw its population boom when it was established as a special economic zone and workers were needed for the manufacturing plants there. 
But governments can also incentivize this as well. Some governments in periphery and semi-periphery countries have relocated their national capital to a new city to try and draw internal migration to another location. The idea is to balance the country out geographically, typically by moving the capital city away from coastal ports to a more centrally located area. Brazil, Tanzania, Cote d'Ivoire, Nigeria, and Pakistan have all done this to try and redistribute the population of the country more evenly. Governments are responsible for managing the city's infrastructure, water resources, sewage, and garbage disposal. And when too many people migrate to a particular city, policymakers must also address issues like poverty, slums, and public safety. But governments are also interested in trying to promote economic development of their cities. They want to bring in new business opportunities, create centers of culture, and improve the livability of their cities by providing access to public transportation, quality education, and reliable and efficient city services. And over time, cities have been influenced by economic development. Cities like Detroit and Pittsburgh thrived due to a foundational economic activity, which we defined as a basic industry last unit, which can help to pull in new migrants, both for basic and non-basic industries. But as you can see, as Detroit and Pittsburgh de-industrialized, economic development declined and people left, leading to declining populations in those cities. And that's where things get especially challenging. When cities are sources of economic opportunity, it serves as a pull factor for migrants. Transportation and communication systems help to facilitate their rapid migration into the city. Many people means lots of tax revenue to provide plentiful services and to grow economic opportunities. But when many migrants move to just one city, there may not be enough jobs, services can get overwhelmed, and people struggle in poverty. There is certainly a balancing act that occurs as cities continue to grow. So what do cities look like today? Well, cities have continued to grow to a point where we need to define a new term. The term urban area refers to the entire built-up non-rural area and its population, including the most recently constructed suburban appendages. This provides a better picture of the dimensions of and population of such an area than the delimited municipality or central city that forms its heart. Essentially, cities have expanded beyond the boundary of the formal region with a very defined boundary to more of a perceptual region. For example, if you were to say you were from Las Vegas, do you mean Las Vegas, the delimited municipality that exists as a formal region, or the Las Vegas Valley, a perceptual region? Which one's more accurate for you and your lived experience? The fact is most Americans and Canadians live in an urban area which surrounds a specific city. About 55% of the world's people live in urban areas today, which is actually a relatively recent phenomenon. Throughout all of human history, we were a predominantly rural species. But in 2007, that changed. And today, over 4 billion people live in and around cities with the greatest number of urbanites today in Asia. And that percentage is expected to be near 70% by 2050. And that's a good place to leave things for this evening. Have a good night, everybody. I'll see you back in class.